hello again. Uh, this video is going to be about Hitchcock. Um, it's going to be a general thing. It's not going to be massively long though. It's not going to be like an epic hour long video that I want to do. I haven't even put any green screen up so I can put images up so that's why it shows you I'm not planning on making it epic. Um, it's based on the fact I've just read uh, Patrick McGillan's biography of Hitchcock. So it got me thinking about Hitchcock and his films, his career and what Hitchcock meant to cinema. Because I've, if you've seen my videos, I, I respect Hitchcock's films but I don't love them. I'm not like um, a massive like, fan of his. I don't like, I'm not an apologist, you know, for Hitchcock. The, the way I would defend the Palm a lot more, I won't defend Hitchcock. I think Hitchcock's got a lot of flaws that aren't acknowledged. I learned a lot of directors. He's, he's one of those directors like Spielberg, who, or Scorsese, whose flaws are kind of ignored by like, a lot of critics in a way that they wouldn't ignore the flaws in someone like De Palma or well, Soderbergh or someone who they'll just <laughs> zoom in on, that's the flaws, I'm mistaking these mistakes here, blah, 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 we hate you, you're overrated. Some of these directors like Hitchcock, Spielberg, even so often they'll get a film where they're kind of trounced just to show them the critics and say, well, we're not biased. We can see their flaws sometimes. But really, they are kind of biased and they, they don't see a lot of the flaws, you know. Um, so Hitchcock had that thing. Even though, um, like later in the career, he kind of um, got away with a lot of the, the cause of his reputation, even though some critics would actually see his films weren't as good anymore. But his reputation was there that he was kind of critic proof in some way. But that's not the, that's not what I'm going to look at here. It's the Hitchcock of this book, and it's a very good book. Patrick McGillan book's really good. He also did a really good biography of um, Fritz Lang. He's done a good biography of Clint Eastwood, which a lot of the Clint Eastwood fans hate because he's he's kind of brutal, but he's been behind the scenes. Um, it's it's he's, he's a really good writer about the facts of someone's life. He's not that great about the films themselves. He's not that interested about the films. He'll, he'll stay as a pain in the films and he'll say this one's a good one, it's a bad one. But when he talks about the films, you don't get the feeling you get. You're listening to a really interesting critic talking about films. You're feeling you're just don't listen to someone who's got an opinion. But his opinion's not that interesting. But he's great at the research and about how things developed, how the, what the process was to making these films, how they affected the person, how the reaction affected the person, what they were doing, and all of that stuff. I mean, this is uh, seen as a corrective to a, a Donald Spoto um, biography called The Dark Side of Genius, which a lot of critic, a lot of uh, people who worked with Hitchcock did not like, because they said it was biased, and it was only looking at the darker side of him, but they didn't look, didn't look in balance to the decent side of his character as well. It was just like overinflating one side, expense for the other, and you weren't getting a full picture. And this, this book's actually... It's, it's good to look in at where his flaws were, but also looks at what are the reasons for some of the legends to grow up around him. How did he contribute to the legends and how did how was he misrepresented? So it is, it's complicated. It's, it looks like a complicated person. Even though in the, in the book you kind of get the sense that Hitchcock wasn't quite as smart as some of his followers would suggest. I think a lot of Hitchcock was an, he's an instinctive director. He understood certain things and he could follow his intuition about certain things and he could understand things visually. Like if you asked him to explain it, he couldn't explain it, but he understood it, like some of the things he was doing by instinct and by his emotional temperament. He understood it, but he couldn't quite explain it to anybody. And I think that's what he had a lot of problems with writers. I think sometimes he wanted something done a certain way because he wanted the visual because he knew that it would pay off throughout the film. But he could never express it directly to the writer or, or explain to them why he wanted something a certain way. He just wanted it. He just knew that was right. That's happens a lot of directors. A lot of directors understand why it's been done but they can't express it. And I think Hitchcock had that problem. And he was also, he just thing about he hated dealing with the plausibles. The plausibles were the people who said every bit of plot 
has to make sense. Like you shouldn't leave plot holes in a film. It's, everything should pay off somewhere. And he was much more about um, the plot leads to the emotions and leads to the, the moments that will affect you. And you'll you you figure the plot holes like I was late and thinking why did they do that and it doesn't really matter because you got the experience, which is a that's the opinion that I've got a lot of sympathy for because I think a lot of time films who try and be too realistic are just boring. And I think sometimes when you got your imagination run right and don't worry too much about those small details, I think you can get a lot more out of the film and you can create much more intriguing. Stories. I think films work as the way myth works. It's like you the plot's just the, the guide, but you're going for imagery, you're going for emotions that affect some part of your brain you can't quite express. That's what Hitchcock was about. But he was also tied to very Victorian sensibilities. I think his upbringing had a lot to do with his character because he, he was born in the late 1890s. He grew up in the after effects of the Victorian era and in lots of ways he was a good little boy who followed the rules, in other ways he was subversive but I think he always returned to good, you know, good citizenship values of um, being one of the team and being uh, a building within a group, even though he had an ego and he wanted his genius to be seen, he still was part of the tribe, he still understood that, and he still followed a lot of values. And I think as he grew in Ormond, some of those values started to change around him. I think he became a bit more adrift because he didn't really understand what the new values were, he didn't understand the emotional reason for the values of the 60s. It was like he was too tight to the first half of the 20th century. Which means, like, up to the 50s, he understood what the world was about, and understood what the drives that people were and after that he didn't and it showed in his work he just couldn't get behind a certain mentality that the 60s onwards had broken from his mentality so that's what's kind of interesting about me he was tied to his tribe but he's also because he's an artist he's also fighting against it in some ways so he liked to prod at it sometimes I act unconsciously but he was still prodding at it but he still wanted to make films that made money Keep himself in a career. He was a capitalist, he was an industrialist, he was he wanted to make money, he wanted to do well in his life, he wanted to be a good member of the tribe, he went to church and things like that. He had a family, he was he had grandchildren, he did all that stuff, he enjoyed all that stuff. He was you can't just see Hitchcock was just this isolated figure who was by himself all the time or something. No, he had a team, he created a team of people who worked with him. And he liked it when he had periods where he worked for a studio or two where you could keep using the same like cinematographer, the same editor. And when some of those people started to die off and later on in his career, again it left him adrift because he didn't have people who he trusted and understood what he was doing. So it was he was a man of his time. And I guess somebody ignored a lot and talking about Hitchcock. And he was very good at synthesizing, you know, emotions for films of what what the images mean to people, why they're affected by suspense, why how they attach themselves to characters and how their you know, their emotions are tied to certain characters and how that can be exploited in a film narrative. He was very good at that, he understood that like intuitively, he just understood it, he got it. But he was also very influenced by a lot of people early on. I mean he went to Germany for a time to work when he was working for the British films and they were having partnerships that he went over so he got to see people like Murnau and Lang at work when he was a young man and he he always referred to the Germans as a big influence on him and Lang was obviously an influence on him. Lang was like always seemed to be like a little ahead of Hitchcock. He went to America first because he didn't been to run for the Germans. He was doing like uh, the B movie suspense that Hitchcock would move into when he moved over to America. Like Hitchcock was doing them in Britain but Lang was really pushing ahead with them. So with time Hitchcock got over and Noir was starting to develop, even though Hitchcock wasn't a Noir director, he could take bits of Noir and bits of like the kind of crime novel and do it as a more polished, like starry movie. But 
Lang was already pushing that forward. Serena Mack and Billy Wild and all these people were purely pushing this forward. Hitchcock could just come in and like make it more easier for the public to swallow because he liked suave leading men and characters you could identify with. So he was much more of an identification of character. So he became like this the person that people just went to for this kind of thing. Because of like by the way they went over to comedy. Cedar Mark and all, a lot of the other Germans were much more low budget people. Fitz Lang moved in and out of various studios because he was obnoxious. Hitchcock got on with people though and he was doing what they wanted and a DVB was also getting left alone because they could trust him to deliver on budget, to work with actors, to develop, to give a project some style, but it'd also be something to recognise to people watching it so they could understand what the film was. So Hitchcock was less a rebel you'd think and that's why his reputation was that of a master suspenseman. He was part. He was a genre of the suspense. The way the Josh Cooker was a women's picture director. John Ford was a western director. Howard Hawks was goes between every other every genre. He was the suspense guy. Sort of like a bit more up market than Fritz Lang. And you know he could work with Cary Grant. He could work with Bergman. He could work, you know, with Jimmy Stewart. He could do all these things, but. He was still an industrial figure. He was still making films and deals with studios for like three or four films and he was still dealing with... He, started, he went over and dealt with David it was Celtic to start with and worked with him and was driven mad by Selznick. You know, and there was lots of um, problems dealing with Selznick but he learned from that experience and moved on and that gave him a good... Because he learned out a lot from Selznick after his first film or two. And he learned to deal with a lot of studios, so everyone knew him. By the time he became a independent, he was known by everybody, everyone knew him. He was viewed as a very good, safe pair of hands. And by the time the studio system collapsed in the 50s, he was a star director because he built his reputation up in the 40s. So he was always like a... A director was always in work, he was always uh, getting work done, he was always... Um, like whenever he did a flop, he always managed to find a way to have a hit. He'd always go back to a, to a suspense movie to get a hit if he was stuck. So even if a suspense movie like Stage Fright wasn't that good, he would still, he'd still make money though. So he, they always knew he could reliably push him back to a suspense movie, put the name Hitch Truck on it, it would do well. If you get something like Cary Grant or Ingrid Bergman and put them in a romantic suspense movie with Hitchcock, it would do well. You know, they would. He was known as a reliable director, so his reputation was of a technical director rather than a genius of anything. It wasn't Austin Wells. Austin Wells was a boy genius in that industry, and his truck wasn't until the 50s. And that's when, that's when the tourist critics elevated him. And they elevated him because he was having his peak period in the 50s. Even though my favourite Hitchcock film is Shadow of a Doubt, his 50s period was had a lot of good stuff. The Real Window, Vertigo, Psycho, you know. Psycho was released in 60, but it was a, it was a tail end of the 50s, really, would have been planned. You know, North by Northwest, I Confess was made at the same time, that did well. There was a lot of films there that he was working on, it was making a lot of money. So that was his peak period, and that's when our tourists noticed him and elevated him. But Hitchcock was still... He was more suited to the industrial direction of something like um, Howard Hawks and John Ford. They were able to tours within that system. Like, they could rally the industrialisation of cinema around what they wanted to do. And so was Hitchcock. It was, it was specifically part of a time period that would think we would move away from. He was at his best when he had some limitations. And when he was forced limitations on him, he had to deal with people like writers and DPs and things who could argue with him. You know, especially writers. He failed with writers a lot. He always seemed to have this opinion that writers could be replaced. Like he would have quite a few writers in each film. He felt they could be replaced with someone else. 
And it worked for a while, but eventually you run out of writers who are good. And in the 60s, he seemed to, he had a problem where he was working with writers and it wasn't as productive. I think some part of it was he thought he knew too much. But also the thing is, I think he kind of burnt through a lot of the good writers and he needed to them by, they didn't understand his system of how he worked and how he developed projects, but it was through a couple of different writers. Sometimes he'd hire one person who was good at uh, construction. And then he'd bring someone else on for the dialogue because he needed good dialogue as well. He understood different parts of cinema. But he couldn't tell the writers that. Like, I'm only using you for one part of this project because you're good at that, but I'm not using you for this other part because you're not so good at that. And he would go in half with them if they fell out with him and he would never talk to them again. And he was very sensitive, much more than he ever let on. I think that came around most when around writers because writers were the crux of the creative process. That's when he worked everything out. Was to write a script, doing the storyboards, and they were like tied to him. He'd have lunch with them, he would have dinners with them, and then they'd, they'd be shut off because they disagreed with something. Instead of saying, Look, I'm a director, this is the way it's going to go, uh, and just talking to him in a logical fashion, like, This is my film, he would get any spats with writers and even become too personal and it would let things escalate and people would have massive phones out rather than small phones out because he didn't, he'd rather avoid confrontation and things would fester up to end up losing the right of like real window because of spats over credits and he would, Ernest Lehman who wrote um, North by Northwest, they would fall out because Lehman was um, Lots of ideas, but he was. He went to his own, beat his own drum too much for Hitchcock. <laughs> and, and you know, it was like Hitchcock needed to be the star. And I think that caused a problem really in the writers' rooms because he was the star and he was trying to figure out the film, but I don't think he treated his collaborators in, in the writing room as well as he should have. I think because they're the only used to work with certain people who could take it. And then he, he was an up and up and up. He was dealing with people who were, had their own egos and that caused problems. So Hitchcock was an interesting figure. I think he had really done to place what's good about him as part of a time period. The same way you can look at John Ford, Howard Hawks. They were part of a system. The strengths and weaknesses were defined by the system they were working in. But how well they worked within it or how well they manipulated to get their own way. He was very good at that, but he was flawed as well. We had lots of films that were boring. I find Hitchcock films, a lot of the time, there's some great moments in them, but I think sometimes, because they had problems with writers, I think there's a lot of films that had really, like, boring moments that went on for ages. It was just like, I kind of feel there's a kind of shift with Hitchcock. Some of the films are terrific, but other ones... We'd see his old-fashioned values come out and pacing and it was all very conservative and it doesn't really translate that well. And there's other films like Real Window, North by Northwest that translate brilliantly because he was working with really good writers who understood how he'd write the dialogue for pace so that he never had those dead spots. And how the heck Cock couldn't write himself and get over the dead spots. So that became a problem. But reading the book, it makes you more sympathetic to Hitchcock, but it also makes you clearer on what his strengths and what his weaknesses were. He wasn't a serious, he just was bad with people a lot of the time, and he was cowardly dealing with certain people, and he wanted to think a certain way sometimes for a reason that he didn't articulate well to, to certain people. I think if you liked him, if he liked you, you wouldn't have any problem. I think if he thought you were his enemy or he thought you were lazy or something, he can be like difficult for you because especially the older and he got more tired and he was, every film was more difficult for him to make. If someone was causing trouble for him, he could be mean to them because, but why put up with them? So he did believe revenge sometimes. I think that did not help. I think also the fact that he was not good with certain people and caused resentments with people because he couldn't deal with them. He couldn't deal with them as other people, not as, his, you know, writer, it didn't work. So, 
I urge you to, watch, to read this book. The Pat McGill and Bug for Hitchcock's really good, and I th it made me appreciate Hitchcock a lot more and more in his interesting character. Even though I, he's still in that kind of level, and he's a very good director, but someone who I don't really respond to that much. I hope you enjoyed this, and I'll be back tomorrow for my final video.